Welcome to a special report from Prop G Markets. Our analyst, Mia Silverio, spoke with Gary Marcus, a colleague and NYU professor, AI critic, and host of the new podcast, Humans vs. Machines, to get his inside perspective on the congressional AI hearings. Professor Marcus testified before the Senate along with Sam Altman, CEO and founder of OpenAI, about the need for regulation in the industry. Take it away, Mia. I was just hoping you could give us a sense for what it was like to be in the room for the uh, congressional briefing. Kind of what was the what was the vibe? Was it friendly, confrontational, tense? Kind of how how, how was being there? I've been to Washington D.C. many times in my life. I grew up nearby. And I walked by the Capitol the night before, and it just kind of blew me away. You know, the, the weight of the history of that building and the nation and what it is we're trying to do here this week and in the next several months, trying to plan for AI, which is something the framers never thought about. I was really moved by it. Um, I'm glad I did that walk because I got it a little out of my system, but I was still blown away to be there. I mean, that was history in that room. You know, hopefully we capitalize on that history, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, maybe we don't. That's historic, too. Um, it was really amazing being in that room. It's kind of like smaller than you imagine it from the movies in a way. Um, but like the senators are up there on, on their podium kind of above you, you know, in their regal way. Um, and it, somehow there, there's a physicality to it. And then the other part of the physicality for me was sitting next to Sam Altman, who was, of course, in many ways the focus um, of the hearing and like being able to see him from a few feet away and, and get a read on when he was nervous and when he seemed to be trying, you know, when he was trying to be ingratiating maybe and when he was sincere. Um, and so that, that was all kind of amazing to me. And the event itself was historic. It, there's going to be several hearings. This was just the first, but there's a symbolic significance to that. And it was incredibly bipartisan. You know, whether we get all the way through what we need to do here in a bipartisan way is a totally open question. But at that first meeting, you know, Blumenthal and, and Holly started with remarks that were very similar. They both outlined that we have a positive future here and we have a negative future here. Holly gave the metaphor, this could be like the printing press or like the atomic bomb. And he was totally right. And all the senators, or almost all the senators in the room and those of us on the panel, all realized we don't know how to get to that positive future and how to avoid the negative future. We we're all there for the same reason and all with, I think, a deep sense of intellectual humility. And I thought that was amazing. And, you know, we will either look back on this and like, and they seized that moment and, you know, figured it out and rose to the occasion. Everybody in the room, almost everybody in the room agreed, we need regulation here. Maybe a national agency, maybe an international agency, as I've been putting forth. Um, we all kind of agreed on those principles. And now we have to see whether we we um, managed to pull through on all that. And you mentioned you could, you were so close to Sam that you could kind of tell the moments when he was seeming really sincere, the moments when he, you thought he felt nervous. What were some of those moments? I'm intrigued. I mean, I think one of the moments that's, going to go down in history is when I pushed him. Um, you're not supposed to do much of that, but I was told like, if I really felt like it was important, I could do it. And there was a moment when Blumenthal um, asked Sam, you know, what's your biggest fear here? And Blumenthal outlined his own biggest fear, which is really about jobs. And Sam said, I'm not so worried about jobs. You know, we've always had technologies that change the jobs, you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but you could, you could say things like, well, you know, we don't have too many horse riders anymore, but we have lots of taxi drivers, you know. So, so th things change, but there's still jobs. And he didn't answer the question of what he actually feared. And I know that Sam actually feels, fears kind of existential risk stuff, as they call it, um, you know, deep destruction to the planet kinds of stuff. And I said, you might want to ask Sam what he's really afraid of, because I thought it was important to get on the congressional record. It's a full range of things, both short-term risk and long-term risk. And I tried to emphasize that to some degree in my own remarks, but I think it's also important what Sam thinks. And you know, he's a representative of a whole industry and the, you know, the fastest rising company here. And so Blumenthal, at my behest, went back to Sam and said, what are you most afraid of? And Sam said, I, and I, I should memorize the quote, and I didn't, but he said basically, you know, significant harm to humanity. And I could see in like the muscles in his neck and stuff. 
this man was like speaking a truth he didn't want to say, but that he felt was true. And he was, he was both sincere and evasive in a certain way at the same moment. Like he didn't want to exp- go into all the detail and make it as scary maybe as he thought for whatever reason, whether posturing for the company or just he didn't want to frighten people. Um, it sounds like he's had some private conversations with Blumenthal about these things. Um, but I could tell he was, you know, speaking from the heart, whether or not he wanted to, like, that is his biggest fear. And he made that clear. There are other, other moments too. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, stuff on, on Twitter today about how Sam is just kind of looking for regulatory capture. He's trying to like posture. And in fact, Professor Galloway himself, you know, kind of raised this question. So Scott put out a couple of tweets saying kind of we've been to this movie before, referencing a bunch of different social media executives saying that we welcome regulation and implying that they didn't really mean what they said. And you responded to that. Can you explain some of that exchange and why you disagree with Scott? You know, you, in in fact, Professor Galloway raised the, the question of whether this is just kind of posturing. It, it might have been for Zuckerberg who said something similar. He's like, bring regulation. And probably Zuckerberg felt forced to do it and maybe wasn't very sincere. I thought when Sam asked for regulation that he was sincere. And some of that is also backstory between Sam and me. Like, we don't get along that well. We haven't met that many times, but we have sort of some fiery exchanges on Twitter. Um, and I have been pushing for an international agency for AI. And when we said hi to each other at the beginning, he said, you know, I really support that idea. I think it's a good idea, Gary, Um, which surprised me because we have had some conflict before. And I said, well, you should tell that to the room. And he did. And, you know, given our background, he didn't have to do that. And he certainly didn't have to do that as I support, you know, Professor Marcus in in such and such. Um, That's, I think, because he genuinely believes what he said in there Um, and not just because he's like trying to play the room. I mean, he's. You know, he's a corporate guy and there are certain moments where I think, you know, he could have said more. And, and you know, I think he's more optimistic about the current state of AI than I am and, and so forth. But I think he was very sincere. And I could just like see that because I was next to him from the side, you know, three feet away, you see things that you can't on the camera. And I actually said as much towards the end of the testimony. I said, I'm sitting next to this man. and I, I think he's he's speaking sincerely. Continuing with the theme of regulation, I wanted to talk about GDPR. And while it's important privacy legislation, it's been received as relatively ineffective and for the consumer essentially just adds one extra click to the digital experience. I'm wondering how you think we ensure that the regulation that we devise is really meaningful. I think it's a super hard question. I'm not enough of an expert in policy and and really how governments really work to be able to give you a perfect answer to that question, or even a very Mm -hmm. good one. I think it is the question of the hour, how how to make sure stuff really has teeth. There are ways in which the GDPR actually does and not not enough, but, you know, it caused a temporary halt on uh, ChatGPT. And, Mm -hmm. you know, one thing to say is that laws need to be iterative. So, with ChatGPT, it shut, you know, GDPR actually did in Italy shut it down. And then they kind of played some games with terms of service and, and then they were back online. Maybe that just suggests, you know, the laws need to be iterated some. So that's, that's one piece of it. Um, I don't think anybody's expecting we're going to get this all right on the first time. I think a second thing that it suggests is that we don't want Congress here to make, to kind of micromanage every decision. This is part of why we want an agency. And I think was part of the sense of the room is Congress is there to make enduring agencies, enduring laws, but not to do every detail. So like the FDA is at a distance and has some authority. You don't want Congress there deciding, you know, are, I don't know, immune related drugs for cancer a good idea or not. Like that should probably isn't, isn't, you know, Congress's thing. They don't know enough about the science there. Um, you know, Congress itself maybe doesn't know enough about CRISPR that they should necessarily directly themselves make a decision about CRISPR, but maybe, you know, some group of NIH should or or, or whatever. Um, I think that there needs to be, let me put it a different way. Somebody, which I don't remember which senator is, but raised the notion that Congress is supposed to take the long view, and this is a fast moving thing. And so 
Congress can do some things here, like establish agencies, but that doesn't mean that their charge should be to like have a new law when GPT-5 comes out as opposed to GPT-4. That's not what they're built to do. And so that it presents a special moment in our history where we do have this fast moving thing and they're not going to be the ones to directly handle it. So I think that's a long way of saying we need indirect governance here, agile indirect governance, where somehow Congress can vest some authority in some other agency that itself is you know up to speed on all of the things that are going on um, and can make the right decisions. You know, it can't be that we go to Congress every time there's a new advance in large language models or some other aspect of AI and say, like, re-legislate this. You can kind of see that in the EU thing. Like, they made these pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good laws last year. Um, well, they weren't laws yet, but pr pretty good proposal. And then, you know, generative AI exploded and they had these four definitions of AI and they're like, how does this even fit here? And do you really want to you know, convene every European country every time you have to make that change? Or do you want some, you know, body with the right expertise, the right balance of government representatives, corporate representatives, scientific representatives to have enough authority to kind of deal with things at the moment? So indirect governance that is agile, that can move fast. These are all important. Um, in terms of the regulatory capture side, it can't be just the government's and the corporations at the table, that's just not going to work. They're going to make sweetheart deals that, you know, keep the government in power and make the companies happy. And that's not what we want. Um, and so I've been really stressing hard having scientists and probably ethicists and, and other folks at, at the table so that it's not just the governments and, and the companies working together. Mm -hmm. I really liked your idea about having kind of an FDA like clinical trial um, requirement so that the, the newest and greatest AI products are tested before they're released to the public. Um, do, do you know if Sam would support that? I, I listened to a good amount of the testimony and I didn't hear him say explicitly or give explicit support of that idea. One of the things that I suggested a couple months ago that didn't get the attention that it deserved, but I was able to kind of revive at the Senate the idea of having something like an FDA, not literally the FDA, but something like the FDA for AI, where in order to get something permission to have widespread deployment, you'd have to go through some kind of demonstration that the benefits outweigh the risks um, and poss possibly have phases. So, you know, we have phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, phase three. You don't roll things out until you've go gone past the first couple. And, you know, there's some give and take there and you try to persuade people scientifically that you have some value there. I think we should be doing something similar for AI where, you know, it's fine if you want to test something on a hundred people or a thousand people, consenting subjects and so forth. But if you test something on a hundred million people, you're actually not even just using those hundred million people as subjects in your experiment. You're using the whole society as a subject in your experiment without consent. You know, did you consent to a society in which chat GPT can shape the political opinions of a lot of people? No, you didn't. And, you know, yes, it is doing that, like it or not. Um, that's just one example. Um, so there, there are many consequences for something that is scaled out to 100 million people, and we might want requirements. Now, Sam was and was not supportive of that. Um, he was very supportive of regulatory licensing, um, especially for particularly large models, and they do some internal auditing. He didn't quite address what I was raising, which is really the external parties should do some of the auditing. So he actually, I'm trying to think where, let me get this correct. I think it's in the, I can't swear to where I saw this, but I believe it is in the open AI statement on AGI that they wrote a couple months ago. They said they could envision a time in which outside regulators might be required to audit systems before they were released to the public. I don't think he said that in the room. Um, but what I would say is that time is basically now. That should be the model going forward. Um, you know, we have peer review in science. We should have peer review for things that go out to 100 million people. And yes, OpenAI did its own internal auditing, let's say, on GPT-4. But there are many problems with it from a scientific perspective. They have this report that looks like a scientific paper. But I was a scientist for, you know, and still am, for, for 30 years. And, you know, I look at it. 
as if I were reviewing it for some journal and I'm like, okay, but you need this control, you need that control. You know, for example, you say that the system uh, can pass a law school exam. Well, that's a very important claim. And then you have a control there where you say not that much of the data is contaminated by having actual LSAT exams in the thing. But what you looked at, it was only, I think, verbatim, couldn't even tell for sure. It seemed like what they looked at was verbatim repetition of test questions. That's one measure of contamination. But we in the field know that these systems are very good at synonymy, at recognizing that this word and that word are basically the same. And so you need a more sophisticated measure to really say whether or not these things have been contaminated. Um, it might be that all the test questions are just a few words away from things that are already in the training data. And then that gives you a different worldview if it turns out it doesn't really understand medicine. It just understands things that are very similar to test questions we've had. That's an important question. A scientist would know how to drill into that and say, give me this extra data. But we also need gov governments to make that work. We need the governments to say, give those scientists the data that they need. Right now, open AI is not open. There was actually an interesting interview with Elon Musk about this just yesterday, um, I guess, this, or this morning, um, where he said, you know, he formed the name open AI it was supposed to be open. It's not open anymore. We don't know what's in GPT-4. We don't know what it was trained on. So scientists can't do the review that we really should be doing here. And so governments and scientists, I think, have to work together. So do you think that GPT-4 should not have been released without an independent audit. Do you think it was, do you think it was irresponsible for OpenAI to release that technology without a uh, independent I will review? Ever so slightly duck that question and say this: okay. What happened with GPT-4 happened, and what happened with Sydney and Bing happened, and what we should do now is to learn a lesson. You know, maybe those were already at the point where we needed these evaluations. Maybe they weren't quite there, but we're there soon enough. And going forward, we need to have these evaluations before things are released. It's great that OpenAI did some internal testing. I don't know how much internal testing Microsoft did for Sydney. I mean, it seems to me they did a little bit. They actually got some feedback. There were problems and they just put it out anyway. That shouldn't be entirely their decision. So, you know, whether or not right decisions were made around GPT-4, I think this was like a dress rehearsal. We're going to get to more and more empowered AI and hopefully smarter AI. I think the AI we have right now is not that smart, but maybe that's a story for another day. But, you know, AI is going to grow and we need to have procedures in place so that when things get released to 100 million people, they don't cause problems. We have a handle on what we're going to do about those problems and not just, hey, I've got this new thing. I want to crush my competitor because they're going to have consequences. And so I think we learned from this last round of deployment that it's too much up to the companies and that we shouldn't let them set all the rules. Mm -hmm. And from your mm, kind of more educated, nuanced perspective of these tools, do you think that OpenAI has a massive head start? Do you, how does OpenAI com compare to Google's efforts in the space? On a technical side, OpenAI is not particularly far ahead. Um, you know, there's a very interesting paper from Google, a, a white paper from Google in the last, <clears throat> let's say, 10 days about how there's no moat. Um, it's leaked, believed to be written by Google. And the point of this paper is neither Google nor OpenAI has much of a moat that open source community is very quickly catching up to what these guys can do. Um, there, are, there are some moats. So, you know, Google and OpenAI have a lot of infrastructure built. They have a lot of data that they've already scraped from the web, things like that. Um, and OpenAI in particular has a lot of data from their human reinforcement learning that is of some value. Um, it's hard to put a precise uh, notion on, on you know, a precise value on that value. Um, it's hard, hard to make, to quantify that value precisely, but there's certainly some value in that. And then, you know, I would say definitely OpenAI and Google are, are obviously ahead here, but that could evaporate quickly. I mean, the fundamental technology that we're talking about now, anyway, is the large language model, and it's pretty well understood how to make those. Um, you know, OpenAI has brand recognition that's going to you know last for a long time. So there are advantages here, but somebody could come on with a better technology. Like there was a paper in the last week saying maybe we only need 1% of the data if we do the training right. 
that could totally disrupt the field if that paper you know proves to be correct. Um, and if that one's not correct, somebody is eventually going to find much more efficient ways to train these models. We know kids learn from vastly less data um, th than these systems. We know that humans are much better reasoners. Somebody's going to invent a system that can reason better. And so the whole field is going to get disrupted a bunch more times. So OpenAI is in the lead right now. Whether that lasts is really hard hard to predict. You know, they've well capitalized. That helps them. But there's a lot of variables here. And so you know, the race is not over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the open source question is is really interesting to me, um, especially given kind of the history of, of OpenAI and how it's evolved from this like generous nonprofit that was just trying to benefit humanity to now it's a capped profit at like uh, they can only make like hundreds of millions and billions like i don't know it's just kind of funny um but what is the like what's in it for them to make the data or open source and their technology open source like now they're kind of in it for some money why I mean, would they do that well, I mean, OpenAI should actually be obliged to. They are remain a nonprofit um, at the top. You know, they're, there's a, they're a nonprofit with a for-profit underneath. And as I understand it, the charge of the nonprofit is to make the company as positive a force for humanity as possible. Not, not clear to me that the Microsoft deal actually does that. You know, I think the Microsoft deal's biggest consequence is to rush Google into releasing products that Google didn't think were ready for prime time. I have a hard time reconciling that with the alleged humanitarian mission of the nonprofit. So, you know, I don't think they're actually following their mission anymore. And, you know, that bothers me, especially with a nonprofit at the top. We hope you enjoyed this interview. Huge thanks to Gary Marcus. And if you liked the content, please let us know in the comments. Also, subscribe, share, and smash that thumbs up button.